Gemma, thank you so much for for coming on. We found the time. Um, kids are tucked away. Well, one seems to be running around, <laughs> but um, we've managed to find the time, and uh, I'm really excited to to have this chat. Have you been recently raising two kids? That's got to be a handful of job in itself. I'm very tired. Very, very <laughs> um no it's been great um i had we've got a little three-year-old boy anyway and then we had a little girl seven months ago um so yeah it's been very busy um but fantastic as well um lots of moments when you just think wow like how lucky am i got these two kids and then also lots of moments when you're like ah what's uh, going yeah. on um, yeah. but yeah but they're pretty good kids so yeah no we're really happy any sort of um sporting sort of inklings at the moment that you've seen perhaps from the young boy um <laughs> i hope he doesn't uh, listen to this in the future um at the moment i'm saying probably not i would say <laughs> he's probably not that sporty and um, he's actually to be fair to him when he was two um you and my husband would try and get him like kicking a ball in the garden or throwing and catching and he just showed zero interest whatsoever and we were like, oh, he's, he's not going to be into sport. Um, but he's three and a half now. And probably in the last three to four months, he started showing an interest. Um, he's actually he's actually quite good. But up until that point, we were like, oh, my God, he's like the least sporty kid we know. Like, <laughs> what the hell? Um, we were like, we're going to have to get into whatever it is that he gets into. And at the time, we thought it might be acting because he's he's quite um, quite dramatic at some times. <laughs> um, Actually, he's starting to go lead into sport now. He does swimming, gymnastics, rugby. Um, and he's always asking, when am I going swimming next? When am I going rugby next? So I think he's starting to go that way. But wherever he ends up in, if it's sport, drama, music, art, wherever it is, I just hope that he does find something that he's passionate about. Because um, I think that, especially in this day and age, that was really important for kids. and um, just gives them a bit of focus. So... I mean, I would love it to be small, <laughs> just because I know a little bit more about it. Um, but if not, whatever he chooses, we'll definitely be 100% behind him. Were you sporty as a kid? Was it something that it was you were doing always from day one, or is it similar, yeah. sort of it progressive? I don't remember to when I was really young, but I can remember from being in primary school. So uh, when I started judo when I was six, and I just loved playing all sports. When I went to secondary school, um, I was a part of all the after-school clubs, so netball, athletics, um, football, basketball. Literally, if there was an after-school sports club, I was part of it. And that wasn't to say I was good at all of them because some of them I was terrible at, but I just loved sport. I loved to play in, um, in individual and team sports, probably a little bit more in team sports, actually, because I think that you just get that really lovely team dynamic going, um, which is funny that I ended up actually doing an individual sport of judo, but yeah, I loved sport from day one and I still do now. So so why judo? Like, why did that come about? How did that even start? Who introduced you to it? Um, so my mum took me along to the local judo club when she was, uh, when I was six. Um, her friend's kids from down the road did it. And I think she took me for a number of reasons. One, try a new sport, meet some new people, make some friends. Um, but I think I was also a little bit of a handful. Um, and I think she took me because I've, Bedtimes, I was bouncing off the wall. So she took me along, trying to lose some of that energy and maybe bedtime would be a little bit easier. Um, I'm not sure if bedtime was a lot <laughs> was easier or not, but I, I just fell in love with judo straight away. Fell in love with trying to grab people and smash them over onto their back. And yeah, just loved judo ever since. So there's obviously a big rise in things like martial arts and a lot of fighting sports get a big amount of uh, of um, airtime now but for those that perhaps don't know what judo is could you explain a little bit because this is actually be for my benefit as well i don't fully know what's going on when i'm watching judo um how points are scored how you're winning um yeah. so yeah if there's i imagine that like most sports there's a lot of rules and there are many if there's an overview and a very quick like a, a, a essentially beginner's guide to judo that that that's what we're looking for i don't expect People ask me like the rules of cricket, the sport I play, it's like 400 or 500 rules. So yeah, yeah. If, if there's like no, a quick the, version. Um, there's lots and lots of rules, but basically number one is judo chops do not exist. That's the thing. <laughs> we'll get that out of the way. Judo chops don't exist. That's um, so good. 
<laughs> the next thing is that basically there's two ways that you can win in judo. You can win in standing judo where you, as I said, you grab your opponent and you try to throw them flat on their back. Um, and you can win in groundwork judo and you can win in three ways on the ground. You can hold your partner flat on their back for 20 seconds or you can arm lock them or strangle them into either submission so they submit or unconsciousness um whichever comes first wow. um they're, wow. they're like the four ways that you can win and if you throw someone flat on their back you win straight away and if you throw them partly on their back somewhat on their back you get a score which is called a rosari and if you get two of those you win um wow. so yeah but they're the four main ways that you can win in judo so when with most athletes after growing up and i'm sure similar to you that as you've grown up playing sport and then you've gone into judo there's a transition from when there's enjoyment and then you actually want to compete and mm -hmm. was there what was the sort of first taste you have of success with it and that triggered wanting to go a little bit further for me, actually, I think it was really, really early on from pretty much the very start. Um, I entered my first competition abroad. Um, so I was only seven at the time. Um, wow. So I've been, you know, like a year or so. But you were supposed to be eight to enter in the competition, but my coach just told a little white lie to just get me in. <laughs> um, and I remember winning the silver medal and I was absolutely devastated. And everyone from my club was saying, like, Jimmy, you've done so well. Like, you're actually not even meant to be fighting in the tournament and you've won a silver medal in, like, an international competition. And I just, I still remember now just being absolutely devastated with that. And I think, so even from that point, I knew that I wanted to win. Yeah, right. So it was actually a, a moment, not necessarily of success, but actually something that you'd had a little bit of a knockback and you, mm -hmm. wanted, to, you wanted to try and just, I guess, right that wrong. Is that would that be the best way to put it? Yeah, I, I guess that was just showed me that I like I felt like I'm going to keep doing judo and I want to be the best and I want to win and I want to win gold medals and I don't think I ever looked back really from pretty much the moment I started judo and in my club I was really lucky there was lots of black belts there was quite a few people who competed for um, Great Britain so that the Great Britain flag for my kit and I remember just like looking at them and just being wow, one day I wish I could be a black belt. One day I wish I could get to represent Great Britain. And then obviously as I got older, it became, more, okay, I wish I could become the best in Britain. Then, okay, I wish I could become an Olympian. Um, wow. I even had someone from my club that had gone to the Olympic Games. So, yeah, I was lucky that I had lots of people around me that I could look up to. But it, I think it was from very, very early on. I knew that's the way I was. So what are the what are the attributes that you have to have to be a, a good fighter? What, what are you actually called if you you're a judo, um, judo fighter? Judoka. Judoka. Um, right, okay. Uh, yeah, we get called all sorts, and we're not very precious about it. So yeah, you can call us fighters, judo players, judokas, so, anything so, goes. So what it what what do you yeah what sort of attributes do you have to be to be a a good judoka? Well, I think that's one of the best things about judo is it's not like a sport like basketball, for example, yeah. where if you're not above a certain height, you're not going to be able to achieve in basketball. Like there's just mm. a line. And if you're not tall enough, it's not going to happen, no matter how much you love the sport, no matter how hard you train. Whereas in judo, you can be any shape. You can be tall, short, large, small, literally any shape. And you can find a way in judo to win. Um, obviously, you do need some strength. You need some power. You need, um, a lot of it comes down to technique. But I'd say that the biggest thing that you need is just, for me, I'd call it a bit of stubbornness. Whenever I lost, I was like, I'm going to keep going until I don't lose. Um, so, yeah, for me, from my point of view, I look at it as stubbornness, but I guess you could call it determination. And just, yeah, just keeping, keeping going, keeping stuck in. Was there someone that instilled that stubbornness into you or do you think you just had it from, from the start? I don't know. I think, I think it's definitely ingrained in my personality, um, yeah. which probably in many walks of life isn't a good thing. Um, <laughs> but for trying to get to the top in a sport, I think it, it's definitely helped me along the way. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it probably... Yeah, it's just in me. 
Um, and as I said, it's, it's probably not served me well in a lot of walks of life, but it definitely <laughs> helped me in my judo career. So when when a lot of athletes are performing and a lot of the athletes I've spoken to on this podcast, main recurring theme is around that. Yes, the the tactical, the physical training, the, the physical training is, is one side, tactical is another, but the mental side is the one that really determines the difference between the the best and the okay. It, what was What does that look like in judo? So what are the sort of, mental skills that you have to have in order to to succeed is it things like patience is it is it that pre- preparation in in looking at what your opponents like because you're talking about all different shapes and sizes so i'm assuming <clears throat> there has to be a little bit of knowledge around how to take down certain shapes and sizes yeah. and things like that i think probably the biggest thing is like perseverance keeping on going because especially again if you're a runner and you run the 100 meters and you lose okay you've not won but in judo if you lose not only do you lose you're kind of getting beaten up someone's putting their hand and they're smashing you to the ground or they're arm locking you or strangling you unconscious you're actually not only are you losing but you're you're physically getting hurt as well to a certain extent so i think yeah just that ability to keep on going i guess um yeah did you, did you have moments when you had lost and you felt that that sense of, so I, I don't know, you, the way you're describing it almost sounds like embarrassment. And did you ever have that sense of like feeling, oh, I've just been beaten up and I'm sure there's elements of self-doubt that come in and am I good enough? Like, what am I going to do? What were the oh, things that you kind of went through? Yeah, 100%. Especially, again, it's an individual sport. You step out on that mat and everyone in the stadium is watching and it's one-on-one. There's nowhere to hide. Um, It's you against your opponent. And, yeah, there's been plenty of times where I've not performed well. There's been quite a few times where I've performed terribly. And not only are you just so mad with yourself because this is what you've given up your life to do and you've put so much time and effort into it. But, yeah, there's definitely been occasions where... I fought against people that I should have beat and I'm not. And yeah, you do get embarrassed. Um, but you you get home and you go, right, okay, like I'm not gonna let that happen again. What do I need to do next? Um, but in terms of feeling anxious and stuff before I competed, I up until the day I retired, um, I can't remember having ever competed in a tournament and not felt so, so nervous. I always felt so nervous. It made me feel sick. Um, And I guess eventually I realised, actually, this is a good thing because I know that I care. And I always said if there was a point where I didn't feel nervous when I went out to compete, then I probably didn't want it enough. Um, But, yeah, that that never left. I always felt nervous when I went out to compete. Um, and it didn't matter what level of tournament it was, whether it was just a local competition or the Olympic Games. Yeah, that, those nerves never went. Was there anything you told yourself or anything that you did in order to help sort of steady the nerves a little bit? Was it visualising uh, the performance? Was it a mantra? Was it, um, yeah, and anything that it could have been breathing, but things that allowed you to manage that nerves because there's so many people that manage different levels of anxiety and I think that's such a good way of putting it that if you are anxious it's a it is a sign that you care you wouldn't be anxious if you didn't care so it's already there and people just feel different levels of it so yeah what what were the things that you were using to potentially help it yeah I think anxious is maybe the wrong word I'd, I'd say maybe nervous I always yeah. tell nervous um but I guess I didn't really deal with it until in the end of 2012, beginning of 2013, when I started working with a sports psychologist one-on-one. Um, and working with that sports psychologist 100% helped me to improve my performance. And I know there's no way I would have achieved some of the medals and achievements that I did without having done the work that I did with him. And I always think to myself, oh, what if I'd started working with him or someone similar like 10 years before? Um, yeah. And the thing is, up until the point I started working with him, I didn't really believe in sports psychologist work. I like People before had said, oh, how about working with a sports psychologist? And I was like, no, like, I, I just didn't believe in it. 
Um, and my coach said, no, you're going to start doing some sports psychology work. And I was like, oh, whatever. But just went along. Um, and yeah, within like three or four sessions, I was in. And uh, never looked back. And yeah, it definitely not only improved my performances, but I think improved my enjoyment of being a judo player as well. Was there anything that you got out of that sort of exper- that that experience with the sports psychologist that young athletes that may be at schools um, that are going to feel that level of nerves on whatever scale that is? That could be for sports day coming up. It could be for a team game coming up. Was there something that you got out of those sessions that you think they could easily implement for their own for them for themselves? Yeah, I think. Um, the most simple thing that he said to me, um, he said, okay, so you start getting nervous the night before you compete. And I was like, yeah. He was like, so you pretty much go from zero to 100 nervousness-wise before you've even gone to sleep the night before and you stay like that until you step out on the mat. And I was like, yeah, pretty much. Like, obviously it increases and decreases a little bit throughout the day, but yeah. And he was like, when you're nervous, do you think you're using up energy? I was like, yeah, definitely. He was like, well, how much energy do you think you've wasted by the time you even, you've not even had your first fight yet, you've not even stepped on the mat to compete, how much energy you've wasted between the night when you went to bed and 11 o'clock in the morning when you've eventually stepped on the mat to fight? And I was like, yeah, a lot. And I think by the time I did step on the mat to compete, I was so wound up because I was so nervous that yeah, you have expelled so much energy. And he just, he talked to me about a prep funnel, so kind of like a triangle. And okay, it's okay to be nervous, but using different strategies and stuff to keep my nervous levels down until the point where I was like, okay, so now it's the warm up. I'm allowed to be a little bit more nervous now. Um, But still, I don't want to be raring to go because I want to be raring to go before I step out on the mat. And it was just learning that actually it's okay to be nervous, but just channeling that to make sure that I hit my peak as I was about to step out on the mat so that I actually had energy to put into the contest. Yeah, that's so true. Even in my experience, I've had games where I I felt knackered before going out for a game, like in front of a stadium, like watching people watching mm-hmm. and you're like, people are yeah you they expect you to be at your peak and you're like I've, i almost played this match about five hours ago <laughs> it's, this is this is, i've already gone through it so yeah that mental energy is is literally draining on that that physical energy um so let's talk about the london 20, 2021 at uh, 2021 we've just had that 2012 olympics um obviously the home games like you had the bronze medal match where you got through and that was the the match that got a lot of um media attention after the after the fight and i wondered how you felt going into the the gold medal match thinking of the the potential pressures that were there because the, the arena was rocking on that bronze medal and like you can see if anyone sees the videos like it was it was really insane and the gold medal match did you feel that pressure did you feel any expectations leading into that after what just happened with the bronze medal match um actually no i'd say no i'd say obviously i was aware of what was going on around me um but throughout the day i'd kind of i had five fights that day and i'd dealt with it the same each fight so i'd gone out to fight competed that match once i'd won it i'd gone back to the warm up area and start by prepping for the next match and I just kind of took the day like that I didn't ever look ahead I just took one fight at a time and I came off that semi-final um after winning and obviously I knew then that I had an Olympic medal I knew it was either going to be silver or it was going to be gold and that for me was the biggest moment because British judo we hadn't won an Olympic medal in 12 years for me people would have said I was going to go out and lose first fight and I, it was the moment when I knew, wow, I've, I've actually done it. It was the first time I'd won a senior medal, like at a major games, um, at a major championship. So it was just, it was just a massive relief, massive excitement, massive happiness. But as soon as I went back into that warm up area, it was just the same as it had been all the other matches. Just got down with my coaches 
um, okay, what's the game plan for this fight? Okay, this is how we're going to go out. This is the tactics. Let's get ready. Let's go. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't say that I actually, throughout the day, felt incredible pressure externally. I'd say from my first fight, 100%, I felt pressure externally. Um, but as soon as, I guess, as soon as you are actually into the competition, all those external pressures go away and then it just becomes internal pressure. But mm. up until you step on the mat for that first fight, you definitely do feel, I, I always did, felt it, a lot of external pressure. But then, yeah, once you're in the tournament, I think that kind of goes away because you've just got your mind on the job. Yeah, it sounded like you pretty much took all of your processes and your game plan and used that to sort of drown out the noise and probably if there's anyone listening and thinking like well I feel pressure I feel expectation that that's the simple trick there is to make sure you do have that that game plan you are ready going into that that fight that match that game whatever you're going into with the game plan is would you would you agree with that oh yeah 100% you if you're going and giving a speech or if you're going and going to do your driving test, you don't go being unprepared. You go as well prepared as you can. And so, yeah, you might have done all the training, but if there's other stuff that you can do, like video analysis so that you can work out tactics for a particular team or person, then why on earth wouldn't you do that? So, yeah, 100%. If you've done everything that you can to prepare, of course, in, for me, I always still got nervous incredibly nervous and did feel a lot of external pressure and um, but you know that you've done everything so then it's just going out there and just giving it your best and then whatever happens you might, might still be a bit peed off but um if the result doesn't go your way but you can have no regrets at the end of the day and i think that's the biggest thing yeah and going back to the bronze medal match obviously after you won that game the cameras caught you looking up and saying i love you mum and for people that don't know the story you obviously lost your mum in 2004 to to cancer incredibly sad Mm -hmm. um and and i think there's an was there an element of like dedication in that in that games and did was that something that you were thinking about leading into the performances and because athletes you do hear a lot of athletes that dedicate themselves to certain causes whether it it, sometimes it can be religious sometimes it can be a friend it can be a family member but they dedicate something and did you go into the games thinking along those lines no 100 percent not um i didn't think about that at all it was just something that came out with as i said there was so much emotion that came out in that moment um as i said not only me but for the whole of the british studio community we've been waiting so long for an olympic medal and yeah it was just all of these emotions just coming out at once and that's it just naturally that's what I did um, yeah. and I know why I did it I, I did it because a hundred percent I would I owed so much to my mum my mum put me first in every way of her life um, and at the time I was a young kid and I didn't realize how much that she'd done for me and how much she put me first and how much she put herself second and at, by that in my life um not as much now that i've actually got kids and realized how tough it is but even <laughs> at that life i'd realized wow like yeah she was amazing like she annoyed the hell out of me quite a lot of the time <laughs> but she was amazing and she put me first 100 percent time and i was just so grateful and so thankful and i'd always wanted to be able to say thank you and like i love you mom but so i know that's why those words came out but it wasn't something that I thought about beforehand. It just came out and I didn't even think about it afterwards. It was only when I was getting interviewed and it was pretty much the first question that every person that was interviewing me wanted to ask me about. And I was like, mm. yeah, I did say that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Wow. That, that That's really interesting because people, a lot of people would assume that it was that, but it's still staying clear focused. And I love how you talk about having that perspective now of <laughs> being, being a mum. Um, is there, yeah. are there things uh, like, so a lot of the time on the podcast, I would talk about values of an athlete. Are there certain values you you had tried to live by as you were growing up as an athlete and, and maybe even values that you want to instill into your kids as they grow up? I think mean, just being kind, being like a nice person um, yeah. and then just trying your best. 
like find something that you love doing and try your best at it but the the, the biggest thing yeah just be a nice person be kind yeah um, and i think if you do those two things then whatever you decide to do with your life you should have a pretty good life yeah there's i mean there's so many um struggles that kids have now with different pressures that are coming in from many different angles obviously social media gets that rap and it can be really tough to i guess you you spoke about external and internal pressure and there's going to be different external and internal motivations for a lot of kids now a lot of kids i think are drawn far too much towards the external motivations they're they're too much driven towards like i need to be successful yesterday and why did why aren't i the best champion yesterday and i should be where this person is tomorrow um i guess speaking towards like how if you're really putting it down to what how long is it taking you to accumulate the skills that you had to get to the process to to get to the level you were at i think that's something that people forget sometimes how long like you started when you were seven so six six so yeah. and then you and then you didn't get to the olympics until you were age. so we're talking 19 years yeah um, and i would in all honesty i would say i wasn't at my peak then um wow. people would say my best result ever and on paper and yeah it was my favorite result ever and it probably was my best result ever but i would say that actually two years after that i was probably the best judo player that i'd ever been two, three years after that, say, yeah, 2015. Um, between 2012 and 2016, I had a lot of injuries. So there was a lot of times where I wasn't competing because I was injured. But at some of the points where I was competing, in those points, I would say that's the point where I've been the best judo player that I'd ever been. Um, it was just that the four years had yeah a lot of periods of, injury in them so times when i wasn't competing but yeah so i would say i started when i was six and i was probably 27 28 by the time i would say that i felt okay like this is me potentially at my best and there was still loads of room for improvement in terms mm -hmm. of my knee was so my groundwork judo still had tons of room for improvement um but everything else kind of like mental stuff like physical stuff, all of the stuff that I would say was my type of judo, so the standing work, all of that I would say was, yeah, I was probably the best athlete that I'd been ever been at that point. Did you do anything outside of judo that you think helped make you a judo, uh, a better judoka? Um, I think when I was younger, playing all of those sports um, as a kid, so once I left school, I pretty much didn't and I just focused solely on judo. But up until that point, I'd spent how many years I was at school taking part in tons of different sports. And I think that played a massive part. Um, but at the later stages, um, oh, I don't know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, all I can ever really think is that I did judo because that was, that was my whole life. Like pretty much all I ever did do was judo. I'd say... One thing that probably helped me, but then you could look at it another way and say, well, it did take time away from judo, but I think studying at the same time as being a judo player um, definitely helped me because I had two different outlets. And mm. when one wasn't going so well, I knew that I had to keep going and had to keep pushing because I could see... Oh, it, but it does work when you when you do well and you give your best and because of, I was looking at my judo like it does work so you just have to stick in and keep going whereas I think if I hadn't had my judo my uni potential would have just quit and um, yeah quit before I actually finished so out, outside of the Olympics what were some of the proudest moments that you had in your career um I think there was Two probably. So um, the moment when I was saying I probably became the best judo player at the moment was, I think it was at the 2015 Tokyo Grand Slam. Um, so obviously judo originates from Japan and it's like a massive, massive sport out there. Um, and at the time there was four Grand Slams 
um, across the world. And one of them was at the home of judo, Tokyo, and um, no British female had ever medaled there. And in 2015, I won a bronze medal. So it was only bronze, but to me, it meant so much, not only because it was just amazing to win a medal at the Tokyo Grand Slam in the home of judo, but also because I'd come through so much in the three years leading up to that with all the injuries that I'd had. It just, it felt like a really special moment. Um, and then the second one was actually when I was 21 or 22. And at that point, I pretty much hadn't won a, like a fight, let alone a competition for what felt like three or four years. Um, I transferred across from being a junior to a senior and I just kept getting smashed around when I was going to tournaments and I still believed I could do it, but it just, it wasn't happening. And I remember thinking, am I being stupid? Like, am I being stupid for believing that I can do it? Because at the moment, the evidence is showing that I can't, but I guess that stubbornness just kept me going. And I won, again, it was only a bronze medal, but a bronze medal at the World University Games. And yeah, that was a, a moment for me where I knew I could do it. And it was a special moment because up until that point, as I said, I felt I could do it, but nothing could ever show that I could do it. And I beat three or four really good girls that day who I hadn't beat before. And I guess it was just a stepping stone um, for me to actually really know that I, I could, there was potential that I could make it to the level that I wanted to. Yeah, wow. So if you, if you could write a letter or if you could give yourself one bit of advice as a, as a younger version of you what 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 advice would you give the younger the younger Gemma hmm. probably be a bit kinder to my mom that would have been that would have been the first thing I've gone to bed when I was told to go to bed <laughs> um, but no in all seriousness I think I think just trying your best and um, because there was periods throughout my career when I didn't try my best and I pretty much nearly threw away all the opportunities that I had in front of me. So when I was, oh God, how old would I have been? Like 20, 19, it was probably 19. I moved um, from my hometown of London to go and live in Bath to study at the university there, but also to train full-time. They had a full-time training environment there. It was my first full-time training environment that I went into. Um, and I just peed about. I am... Um, my studying was going terribly. I wasn't handing anything in on time. Um, if there was a really early morning lecture, I'd still be in bed because I don't like early mornings. And training was going the same way. Like, I love doing judo. And I've always loved doing judo. But there's a lot of the training that you need to do to help you become a good judo player that I wasn't so fond of. So running, I cannot run. And I really dislike it. So if on the weekly training session, there was like an hour run on a Sunday morning, I'd quite often, yeah, still be in bed, tucked under my duvet. But telling myself that was fine because I'd go to judo the next day and I'd go to the bit of training that I liked and I'd, I'd like work as hard as I possibly could then and I'd, I'd give it up my everything. And I knew deep down that that wasn't right, but I was telling myself it was fine. And after my first year of being at Bath, I was called into the lead lecturers at the uni's office and basically told that I was getting chucked off the program, not chucked off the program, chucked out of uni. Um, and obviously that was delivered to me in a matter of seconds, but it was as a result of my actions over the last year. But I just broke down. I saw my whole life unravel before me because I knew, okay, not only if I get chucked out of uni, not only do I not get to get a degree and that means I'm never going to be able to become a PE teacher which is I guess the other career that I'd always wanted to do once I'd finished with judo but also I wouldn't be able to afford to stay living in Bath and training in the full-time setup because the only reason I was able to do that is because I was getting a student loan um so I basically broke down in tears there was a lot of a lot of crying um and the lecturer gave me a second chance and to be honest he probably shouldn't have um wow. I didn't deserve one but from the second he said, okay, you've got one more chance, you can redo the year. Yeah, I just knew I would never let myself down like that again. And I think that was a massive turning point for me. Um, if they just let me carry on going the way I had been going, I wouldn't have achieved anything. I, there's no way I would have got to the Olympic Games. 
Um, I wouldn't have a degree. I wouldn't be a PE teacher right now. Um, but yeah, that he called me up on it, and and luckily, thankfully, he did decide to give me that second chance. Um, and yeah, I just from that moment, I knew right, can not let yourself down like that again. So yeah, it was a big, big, big moment. Wow. So you obviously are a PE teacher now. Uh, you're on leave. Yeah. You've not currently been in in teaching. And even and we you mentioned just before we started not through lockdown, but what what things or attributes have you learned along the way that you you're excited or you have already done um, that you've been able to give to to students at school that you you feel are valuable to pass on to them? I think the biggest thing is trying your best. So yeah, like it, PE classes, the kids who I'm given most attention to aren't the kids who are the best at PE or who've got the best swing on the cricket bat. It's the kids who are willing to try. It's the kids who, yeah, okay, I'm going to push myself and I'm going to try my hardest. I might end up last, but that's the best I can get. And that's kind of what I try to get out of all of the kids in my class. I'm like, it doesn't matter where you end up. I want to see you giving your best. And if you're not, I'm going to be screaming at you until I see that you are. Like, come on. And I think I'm probably a little bit too tough, if I'm, (laughs) in all honesty. Maybe some of the other teachers think I am, but... Yeah, I just think, like, there's no reason not to give your best. Why would you not? But I think a lot of school kids, I think actually sometimes school kids can, because they're in front of their peers and when they get to a certain age, they can feel it's embarrassing to be seen to be trying their best. Like, it's not cool to study really hard and do your homework on time. It's not cool to try your hardest and Mm. just trying to get through to them. Actually, no, it is. Like, come on, like, let's give it your best. Let's see what you can do. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest thing. Yeah, that's that's so true. Like, with with kids, it can be real easy to just get caught up in thinking, uh, well, there, I think there's a... F- there's this video that I watched and I can't think where it's from, but it's a, it's a like, college football coach. And he's talking about the kids that he sees coming through the doors into his gym and he's just frustrated because they are swaggering around a little bit and they're like they haven't put in the work he's like you see you see tom brady you see lebron james you see all of these guys at the top of the, they, they didn't do that when when they started in and i think just going to teaching like and especially pe teaching i think it is one of the most important teaching roles in the country in 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 the system because one of the things with PE and physical education is that you are teaching these kids not only like skills like life skills because yeah the subjects that they do at school like they may have an interest in sciences in english in the arts and those may change but the one thing that won't change is your your physical and your mental health that's the thing that you cannot run away from for the rest of your life and at the end of the day if you want to be good at all of those other things physical education and physical, your understanding of your body, understanding of your mind, how to look after yourself, how to treat it right. And then even the added on fine tuned skills you're talking about there, like how to unlock a little bit of self-belief through just trying a little bit harder, how to like overcome an obstacle. Those are skills that f- PE and physical education, like you, you need them for life. And I think you as a PE teacher and all other PE teachers in the country and world hold the key to society being in a better place so- yeah i would say 100 percent. we're not actually teaching kids how to shoot a basketball we're not teaching kids how to jump a hurdle and the perfect technique we are teaching those things i guess but really we're you just using that as a way to deliver what we actually want to get out of them which is yeah learning how to be resilient learning how to be determined learning how to work as a team all of that kind of stuff all those attributes that I guess really help in all other subjects across school but once you leave school are gonna like help for the rest of your life um, and a lot of the kids we teach won't potentially want to go and join a sports club outside of school or after school but they might meet up with their friends and go for a walk twice a week and for a school or like just 
get across to them that it's really important that we look after our bodies because that's going to help us look after our minds. But then just, yeah, using sport as a, I guess, as a driver, as a delivery method to just help enhance all those attributes that help people in life. Where do you where do you sit on the argument of you see a lot of um, school systems talking about like participation awards and pe- everyone sort of gets a medal? What how where do you sit in that that argument? Oh, <laughs> I'm not actually sure. So before I used to be like, no, it's ridiculous. Like everybody shouldn't get a medal. Like everybody shouldn't get this. And I do still believe that. But the only part of me that makes me think. So it actually does a 360. So I was at a birthday party the other day, a little kid's birthday party, and we're playing Pass the Parcel. And I was the person stopping the music, and I'd stopped it on all the other kids first, other than my kid. And I could see his little face, like, basically crumbling, and I was like, oh, God, like, I need to stop it on him. He needs a shot as well. And then I left the party thinking, well, he doesn't need a shot, does he? If he doesn't get a shot opening, wrapping a layer of the Pass the Parcel that's fine and he'll learn Mm. that actually not every time he gets exactly what he wants but as a parent I was like I wanted to wrap him up and make sure that he was okay and make sure that he was happy but then I realized actually that's going to make sure that he's happy for that second but it's actually going to make the rest of his life a lot harder for him to deal with if he never in the next 15 years has to deal with disappointment and failure um so actually there, so, it made it, so yeah, I went kind of a yeah. 180 and another 180 back to where I was originally. So yes, I think that it's nice for every kid to, I guess, feel part of something. But no, I kind of don't agree with participation awards because I then look at subjects like maths or English. Just because you participate doesn't mean that you get an A grade the same as the kid next to you who might actually be really good at maths and you might not be quite as good at maths. Um, I think everyone should be celebrated for joining in and for doing their best. Everyone should be celebrated for that. But also the people that win, they should get the gold medal or the silver medal or the bronze medal. Yeah, because it takes a bit of work. It takes a bit of uh, of determination. You have to go through those skills. And that's why we get publicly recognised for it when it all culminates into into one area. Look, Gemma, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I was just going to say, and also, if... Sometimes you put in all the work and the hard work and it doesn't go your way. And mm. like, I think that's important because then you realise, okay, it doesn't go your way, but you, you learn how to deal with that failure and how to move on because otherwise you'll get to 25 or however old and something big will happen in your life and you just won't have, I guess, the abilities to deal with something like that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm for no participation awards. I'm a horrible <laughs> piece no i think it's the way i think i I, that's literally where my art side of it sits i think it is totally the way the the dealing with failure learning to pick yourself up and and go again that is the skill that is the skill we all need and we lose that if we just continuously bring out participation awards um because it's going to come at some stage like your parents will leave you like and the big ugly world will rear its head and it'll get you somewhere and if you don't have that armory, you don't have that toolkit to deal with it, you, you're done for. Um, and I, it's going to be a I lot harder. Of other people, because as I said, when it's my kid, I just want to wrap him up in cotton wool. I just want to make <laughs> it perfect for him. I just want to be like, yeah, of course. But that's going to create a little boy who actually probably ends up not becoming such a nice person or not being able to deal with certain things. Um, so actually, I think it needs ex- people to try to do kind of lessons um and i'm gonna try my hardest not to always stop music on him at parties so he gets that i'm not to pass the parcel <laughs> yeah well good luck on those past parcel duties in, <laughs> in in the future but um look Gemma, thank you so much for for your time and for for doing this this evening uh really Thanks, appreciate it. i've really really enjoyed having this conversation and I was someone who actually had watched your performance in 2012, was cheering you on. And, and yeah, it was, it's just so nice to meet you and talk and find out more about how you see the world and, and how you got where you are. So I, I really do appreciate it. And thank you for, for coming on. So thanks for having me, Liz.